Uh, Scotty. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Well, my name is Scott Cowling, or if you're a ham friend of mine, it's Scotty. Uh, my mom used to always tell me she could tell when hams call up on the phone, because I've had my license since I was 14. So when they call up on the phone, they ask for Scotty, she knew it was a ham guy. So it was easy. Uh, it was a early uh, office management, you know. Um, I work for Zephyr Engineering in uh, Tempe, Arizona, and uh, we've been uh, working with SDRs for quite a while. Haven't really got into the hardware until just recently, and uh, they didn't tell me I was going to follow Matt, so that's a kind of a hard, uh, <laughs> hard guy to follow. So uh, some great stuff going on there. Anyway, to start off, um, years and years and years ago, way back in the dark ages, I worked at Motorola when I was young, and uh, we. Uh, we worked closely with the CAD guys. Since I've been, a, I'm a hardware guy, so you, know, you get to cut me some slack. It's really, it's intimidating to look out and see all you high-powered software guys. And I'm going like, I kind of, I understand the words that you're saying, but it's like I'm a hardware guy. It's, it's kind of up here for me. So, we're working on hardware, and we come into the CAD department, and the CAD department, you know, that should be a, a uh, like a hardware den, right? I mean, this is where you make lay boards out, and this is hardware things. So we come into the CAD department, and we see this sign here that one of the CAD guys has been cajoled into lettering up. And we're kind of thinking, we're feeling kind of invaded here because it's like some software guy snuck in and put this guy up to this and made this sign. So not to be outdone and to uh, further promote uh, the antagonism between software and hardware at Motorola, we had our favorite guy letter up this sign. And then they were put side by side, so they knew they didn't get away with anything. So I'm here to talk about some hardware, and I'll give you some quick background. And uh, you guys probably know a lot more than about hardware than I thought after hearing these earlier talks. So I'm probably going to go a little quickly through the beginning stuff. But the example that I have is uh, some very simple, a very simple AM receiver that uh, we designed up hardware to be used as an AM receiver. And I divided it up into seven categories of things that you have to do. Obviously, you've got to get the signal. You convert the signal. Now, again, this is a, a digital down conversion receiver, a little bit different than maybe uh, you've seen. This directly samples the RF. So you get the signal. You convert the signal to digital. You perform pre-processing. And typically, as Matt said, that's like to massage the data so that it's small enough to fit through this teeny pipe that you have compared to what you've converted. Transport it. Process your data, and this is uh, is really where uh, this conference is more concerned with. What what this conference is more concerned with? Then, if you want to listen to it, if it's an AM receiver that is an audio receiver like the AM broadcast band, you want to hear something. It's not data, so you need to convert it back into the analog domain so that you can hear it. So I'm going to go down the line on these and in, into a little more detail. This is the antenna I wish I had in my backyard, but unfortunately, I just want to say that whoever built this, I think this is at Stanford, they have the, uh, their, their priorities right because you see the antenna is here and that's the building. So a little more investment in their antenna <laughs> in the building. So you have to have an antenna to pick something up. You have to filter it, eliminate the part that you don't want. A attenuation or amplification, perhaps. Uh, Anti-alias filtering, if you're going to digitize it, you have to band limit it. And then perhaps some buffering and impedance matching to the next stages. Then you want to do the conversion. And most of this is done by the, either by the A to D or circuitry around the A to D. So again, more input buffering or impedance matching or uh, driving of the A to D. Uh, sample and hold, this is typically inside the A to D conversion. So these two kind of belong together. Some of the features you can use are dithering. And I'm not going to get into the technical details, but you probably know more than I do about this. But dithering and output randomization to help you help reduce noise and increase uh, your resolution. And then also, don't forget, the, probably one of the most important things is the clock generator for the A to D conversions that you're going to do. And we found out uh, very quickly that the clock's very important. Don't, don't uh, skimp on it. In fact, we were lectured by a lot of the A to D manufacturers. Well, you can't drive that clock from the FPGA. That's not a good enough clock. So we, we took that to heart. Then data preprocessing. And um, typically done at higher speed. Uh, Downsampling or decimation. 
filtering done in math in hardware. Now this is like inside an FPGA. And then formatting the data and packetization and the timing of the data to be fed out to whatever size pipe you have. And then the transport, varying uh, types of interfaces here. Um, if you have, like the radio I'm going to talk about in my first, uh, my first of the series, where it's a self-contained radio, the internal, the data transports internally. It doesn't come out of the chip and go across USB or Wi-Fi or anything. And then, of course, the external ones, and my pen is dying here. I need my third hand here to run this. I know how to do this. That's what buttons are for. OK, and the data processing, either internal in an FPGA or a as a combination. So in other words, you can use the FPGA not only to downsample, but you can use the SP FPGA to actually do your processing, too. Or you can do external, which means you're going to do your processing with GNU Radio over on uh, the uh, vehicle of your choice. And then data conversion back to the analog domain so you can hear it. Audio DAC or codec. And uh, usually need some analog low pass filtering to get rid of the digital artifacts, depending on what kind of chip you use. Sometimes they're internal, sometimes you have to put it externally. And then analog buffering to drive speaker, headphones, whatever you like. This speaker is what you need. Need a big power amplifier for that speaker, though. So the signal delivery would be speaker or headphones or whatever you like, wireless headphones. OK, so uh, just a couple more slides of background. Bear with me. Um, I'm an FPGA guy. and. I'm a ham, so the radio stuff kind of came later, so I know about FPGAs. When I saw this thing come out on the market, I'm just going like, okay, now that's an SDR waiting to happen. That's what, that's what this was made for. Well, Altera and Arrow argue with me about it, but I know what it was really made for. So what, what does this have on it? It's got an embedded bite blaster. How many of you know what a bite blaster is? Hardly anybody. Okay, it's, it's uh, the Altera programmer. Okay, it's a USB blaster. is a USB on one end and a header on the other end that hooks to a, either a JTAG port or a PROM programming port. So you can program PROMs or you can download the SRAM inside the FPGA. And everybody knows what an FPGA is, right? Anybody not know? Oh, great. Okay, so I know, I know uh, a friend of mine's a software guy, and he was helping me review this. He says, oh, well, you better tell these guys what an FPGA is because not everybody's going to know. I'm like, oh, come on now. Anybody who's used the USRP knows what an FPGA is, right? So, anyway, flash prom on board, some SD RAM, which is on the back side. Unfortunately, not gigabit Ethernet, 10100 Ethernet. Also, a micro SD card socket that's on the back side opposite this RJ45. Some LEDs over here, a stack of eight of them, a slide switch here, and three push buttons here. There's also a temperature sensor, which I haven't used yet. And then we've got an 80-pin I.O. connector, an edge card type connector, and an onboard oscillator. And the amazing is, most amazing part, it's only 80 bucks. So not bad for all that. I'm just, I look at that and say, how can I make that and sell it for 80 bucks? Have to get an outside job to support the money I'd send with every one. This is the block diagram of the SDK. So you can see all the peripherals around the Cyclone 4. It's a a 4CE22, so it's 22,000 LEs is the size of the FPGA. Okay, so this is uh, what we kind of came up with as a product line uh, summary, if you will, for the B micro radios. And when we mentioned this to Altera and Arrow, they got very excited because there are some other kits that you can buy to go with the B micro board, like for instance, they have a PWM kit which allows you to experiment with pulse width modulation of motors. It's a motor controller. And they, they call it B in motion. So it's kind of a play on the B radio thing. I mean the B, uh, the B micro thing. So when we mentioned we thought, well, you know, we ought to make a radio out of this. They got pretty excited and they said, well, we ought to call it B radio. And I'm going like, well, that's great, but like how do I fit it in with the other units in my product line? So this is, you got to have a nice easy name that people will remember. Like USRP, great, great name. So we call it HF0, HF1, and HF2, although the official name here is B-Radio because that's what Arrow wanted us to call it. So 
So basically three levels of performance here, 100 kilohertz to 2 megahertz, and actually it's really, the Nyquist frequency is 5 megahertz because we sample at 10. But this was targeted for a medium wave receiver, a demonstration board. So that's why we put a 2 megahertz low pass filter on here. Very inexpensive and just uses an entry level demonstration platform. Next one up is samples at 80 mega samples per second. And uh, so really usable up to 30 megahertz. A little bit steeper price. But uh, as you'll see, uh, get down the line here what it looks like. And the final one is uh, the uh, high end one. How many people know what, o uh, what HPSDR is? Anybody familiar with that? A couple people? Okay. Well, this is basically the receive, receive strip off of the Hermes board. So it's uh, pretty high performance, uh, same parts, same architecture, just sliced off and put on a separate board. And the FPGA, of course, is on the B micro, so it's just the front end portion. So for, let's start with the first one. Let me show you what it is. I have a picture of it here a little bit later, but. This is the size of the board. If you can see it, it's uh, pretty small. Easy to lose in your pocket. OK, so of our seven stages here, which gets assigned to what? OK, the first two are going to be B radio. Then we're going to feed the data over to the B micro SDK, where we're going to do pre-processing and the data transport. Now, this is the case where the transport's internal to the FPGA. So there's not really any pipe here. It's just virtual. And the data processing is, going to be processing is going to be done in here. And this is where the demodulation occurs inside the FPGA. And then we actually have a uh, audio DAC on the B radio board. So we send the data back over to the B radio. So we have where the audio DAC is and the headphone amplifier. So you basically, with the twin boards, you get a complete self contained radio. OK, so this is. Uh, the, the hot bullet list here has an onboard medium wave antenna. Well, you can, if you can see it, the medium wave antenna is this little orange mustard colored looking thing on the corner. It's just an inductor. And the reason this wire is on here is because that's horribly inefficient. It doesn't work very well. So we, we cheated a little and gave you a way to add some RF into the front end. 12-bit ADC at 10 mega samples per seconds. 12-bit audio in the audio DAC for your audio output. and uh, Pretty low power headphone amp, but it does the job. And again, frequency range 50 kilohertz to 2 megahertz. And uh, usable to 5 megahertz. Now, I, I say with modification, OK, uh, how many people have soldered 0402 parts? OK, well, you guys can buy this and use it to 5. You other guys, see them in the back. They'll help you out because they're very small parts. But you, can't, you have to do some soldering and change the components. But you can change the filtering to a higher frequency. And again, it's used with the B micro SDK. And the cost goal is around $30. The way we get it so low is it's really subsidized by Arrow. So this is a, a learning tool. So uh, look for this to come out. I think it's going to be pretty exciting what they're going to do with it. I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. So this is the system diagram. I'm going to kind of delve down to e into each one of these blocks. But basically, this is to show you kind of how you plug it together. You've got the radio with your phones hanging off the side. This is the 80-pin edge connector, the B micro SDK. And notice the USB is used only for power. Anything in orange on here, that's optional. So the way you get the code into the B micro is you use the USB. But in operation, you don't need the USB for anything but power. So now on the board itself, this is what we've got. Here's your, the ferrite antenna here, the coil. And what we determined was uh, you can't really cover the whole band if you want to have any kind of efficiency in the antenna. And really, you get no, not much efficiency anyway. But you get a little bit better by using some, a parallel tuned circuit. And since, since we wanted to cover the whole band, we used a CMOS switch to switch in different capacitors. So you really get a tuned antenna. And you can select which band out of the four bands you want to use. And, and the selection comes from digital I.O. lines from the FPGA. Then this buffer here is basically an impedance transforming buffer. Keep the load off of the antenna. Anti-aliasing filter, you notice it's 2 megahertz. And then mucho gain here, 30 dB of gain out of the ADC driver into the 12-bit ADC over to the FPGA, the connector. And the clocking, what we did is we, uh, we put a 10 megahertz oscillator on the board. And th this is kind of funny, because there's a 50 megahertz oscillator already on the FPGA board. 
when we set this up, the guys over at Linear Tech said, "Oh, well, you know, you can't do, you can't use that. I mean, that's that's an FPGA oscillator. I mean, that's that's going to have lots of jitter, and it's it's not just not going to be a good oscillator." So we put this oscillator on there. Well, I hate to tell you this, but it's the same class oscillator as the one that's on the FPGA board. So I don't really see how this is going to be much different. So what we say it is, okay, I'll put a MUX in here, and now I can pick use the FPGA. I can pick the source. I can either drive it myself or I can drive it here. So I can divide my 50 down or use a PLL to dr divide it down, generate it on the B micro board and feed it over here and use it, or I can use the local onboard one and it's selectable in software. So now we get to try out there, we get to check them and see, well, is it really suitable or isn't it? Then also coming from the FPGA, this is an I2C uh, serial DAC. So this is a, about four lines. 5 kilohertz low pass filter and a headphone driver. This is really like a voltage to current converter is all that is. And then inside the FPGA, the dotted line is the FPGA boundary. These things, this is on the B micro board. These are just here for reference. These are over on the uh, RF front end board. I mean, this, this should look very familiar. I've seen uh, at least four slides this morning that show this kind of topology here. So. Pretty simple, uh, just a 5 kilohertz bandwidth AM receiver. That's all it is. And there's a picture of it up close. You can see the uh, inductor over here. A to D is right here. The amplifier, I believe, is right here. And this is the CMOS switch to select the antenna capacitors. Here's the oscillator. And the uh, audio DAC is right here. The B micro plugs into this guy over here. And there it is plugged together. I can show you this. This is what the, what the B micro looks like. And I've got these up here if you want to play with them after, after class. OK, now you might you gotta go back to this and say, well, the, the astute, sharp-eyed ones would notice that there are some parts over here that aren't on the board. Well, we thought that uh, 10 mega sample per second, while it might be a cool AM radio, is not very performant. So we kind of laid it out with a few extra parts on board. And what we do is we call this the HF1, and we take the 10 mega sample per second part off. We put an 80 mega sample per second part off. It's also 14 bits instead of 12 bits. We change the oscillator to 80 megahertz instead of 10 megahertz. And we take off that silly uh, medium wave antenna because that's probably not what you're going to use anyway. And we put on a mini circus low pass filter and an SMA connector. And also, we reduce the gain of the amplifier a little bit, which I'll show you in a second, because it uh, gets kind of uh, so. Because you, you might have been wondering, well, I'm up here talking about Great Harbor. Where, where's GNU Radio? There's no mention of GNU Radio. Well, there's the first right here. So now we're going to not do everything in the FPGA. We're going to to acquire the signal, pre-process it, crunch it down to the right size and send it over to GNU radio for processing. And then you can do whatever you want. You're not limited to uh, just an AM radio. You can do whatever you like. And if you choose, you can send it back over to the board, to the audio DAC, and use your speaker. Or you can just use a typical GNU radio way as you can put it on your PC speaker. Or if you're transmitting data, then you're not even going to get sound at all. So again, the bullet item, this looks vaguely familiar. This is different. Uh, this is different. Same exact size. In fact, it's the same PC board. So if you're really ambitious, you can buy a $30 one, and you can, which is subsidized, and you won't have to pay $175 for the other one, but you'll have to warm your iron up and change some components. Okay, so this, again, the system diagram looks uh, kind of familiar, although now this is optional because typically we won't use that. And the, we will use the Ethernet because this is going to create UDP packets, this HF1. Now, I want to point out that even though I said that the HF0 or B radio was a standalone radio, that it was designed to, be, to plug the antenna in one side, USB for power, and the headphones in the other side, the B micro still has a port on it for Ethernet. So if you want to do a low performance version, you can plug an HF0 or B radio on here, put the HF1 firmware in the B micro, and now you've got a UDP engine that just runs at a lower speed. So you can still do that. 
So this is kind of what we do. Everything in blue here is what's changed between B Radio and HF1. So you can see that we've taken out all of the uh, the internal antenna stuff up here. Added, since we have an external antenna, we added ESD protection, low pass filter. We changed the anti-alias filter frequency. We lowered the gain of the driver. We changed the ADC from 12 to 14 bits and from 10 to 80 mega samples per second. And the local oscillator is now 80 megahertz. And while this hardware is on the board, we would typically not use it. You just stream UDP packets out and they go somewhere else. Inside of the FPGA, a little bit different load now because you don't want to do internal demodulation. You want to just format the data down into a small pipe and send it out via UDP. So again, very similar decimation and filtering here, decimate by a different number. Cross the clock boundary here into an Ethernet MAC to the onboard PHY. And this is the kind of the housekeeping is run by a NEOS 2 onboard processor. And that is one of those, and I help, happen to have one of those too. And you notice it's very close to the same size, within a few microns. Actually, it's the same size. Okay, so now you probably wanted to know how it works in GNU Radio. Well, it does, and here is a source block for the SDR stick. And I can tell you this is in its infancy still because I got these boards about three days before I left for the conference. I went to the DCC before this, so I, these are brand new. These are just prototypes. So we're making progress here, but it's, it's pretty new. And this is an AM receiver. In case you didn't want to do it in the FPGA on the B radio board, we did it on HF1, and this is the spectrum. This here is uh, our local flamethrower, as we call it, uh, KMIC, Disney Radio, which there are 50,000 watts. If you, look, if you go online and you look at their antenna pattern, our office is right in the middle of the antenna pattern. So, I mean, you can hear it on your fillings. It's really... so. So it's our test station, because you can hear it with a crystal diode hooked to an earphone. And then these are the other stations. It's at 1580 kilohertz. And you can see that it looks like they're doing HD uh, broadcasting. And there's only a couple of stations that have these interesting sidebands on either side, which is a uh, regular user of a regular radio. You, when, you, when you don't use this and you just turn on a regular hardware radio, you feel like blind, because you can't see what's going on. Okay, now the last one I'm going to talk about is the HF2, which is the high-end one. We actually did this board first, and this chart looks almost identical. In fact, I think it is identical to HF1, except that the capabilities of the hardware is better. So we got higher frequency, 122.88 megahertz, 16-bit ADC. We, the uh, DAC is different, too. It's not an audio DAC. It's actually a TI codec. And the reason we did this is we did this, like I said, we did this board first. And when we did the other board, we, uh, were, it was suggested that we not use a TI part, that we use a linear tech part to showcase their linear tech part, so we did. And again, this, is a, this circuitry is pretty much borrowed from the HPSDR program, only with the FPGA work done on the, uh, the B-Micro. Okay, and there's a lot of orange on here because this board is a lot bigger and it does a lot of things that you might find interesting. For instance, uh, and I'll get to the picture, but there's an optional front end filter, so you don't have to live with the one I put on there because otherwise you're stuck with baseband. So if you want to do some undersampling, you could modify the board. There's a header on that there's space for a header on there. We'll likely offer a manufactured variant that doesn't have the mini circuits, 40 megahertz low pass filter, 50 megahertz low pass filter, so you get to put your own on there. So if we modify the anti-alias filter and we remove the low-pass filter and provide a header, we say, okay, now here's a daughter card. I mean, it's kind of like a toy USRP, right? It's a, uh, you could put a down converter on there, you could put a filter, you could put an amplifier, whatever you like. The other thing that we did is uh, we did put the GPSDO input, so you can synchronize it with a GPSDO, similar to other uh, offerings you've seen here. We also used uh, an LVDS buffer and we brought the clock onboard clock out and took the 
an external clock in through a multiplexer controlled by the FPGA. So now what you can do is you could build an array of these and synchronize them off of the exact same clock so they'd be phase synchronous. Even though, yeah, you can correct it in the software, in this case, if they're co-located, you wouldn't have to because they'd all be phase synchronous. Again, the phones are optional. And uh, the codec has uh, microphone connections and all that. And I'm trying to figure out what I could use a microphone for in a receiver. And I haven't figured that out yet. So, but I put them out to a header anyway, just in case there's some reason you want to get audio in. So this is the, uh, the eye chart here of all. Um, receive chain is very similar. Two low pass filters this is the anti aliasing filter, and this is the uh, mini circuits low pass filter. And you see where the optional LNA or low pass filter could go around this in place of this, really, and not meant to be at the same time. This oscillator is a very low phase noise oscillator. It's also very expensive, which explains why the price of this board is a lot higher, but it performs a lot better. And here's the clock multiplexing scheme that I was talking about that we use. The only problem with this board is it consumes too much power to run off of USB. So you have to use external 5 volts to power this and the B micro. Inside the FPJ, this is basically, except for the decimation rate, it's identical to the HF1 block diagram. The interesting thing is that we get almost 2 megahertz of RF bandwidth out that we can process in parallel on the PC. And if you can believe it, we, we're using an Atom dual core in it on, with GNU radio, and it actually keeps up at 2 megahertz. I was pretty astounded. And there's a picture. You can see the uh, clock oscillator is up here. This is the mini circuits low pass filter. Anti aliasing filter is here. This is the preamp. This is the ADC. And this is the uh, 10 uh, GPSDO 10 megahertz input down here in the circuitry to bring that in. And the codec is right here, up to the headphone jack up here. And this is the power input jack right here. The first thing people usually say when they see this board is, well, how come you have two antennas? Well, not quite. It's not two antennas. And this is a little bit bigger. This is, this is the size of this board. So it's about 60% bigger than the previous boards. One of the cool things that it will do, though, is it'll mount backwards. So it's a nice compact package. And you can see me afterwards, and I can show it to you in person. But it's, and, and we're not sure yet whether we're going to do it this way. The problem is that the RF front end is right under here, and the 50 megahertz FPGA logic is right here. This is not a good idea. Even though there's like four ground layers, three ground layers in between, it's still not a good idea. So it may end up that we, we end up with it like the HF1 and the B radio with it stuck on the end to make a longer stick type architecture. Now, this is, this is the last slide I have. And this is something that we kind of came up with in response to the FunCube dongle. And this is kind of like a FunCube dongle front end with the back end the way we wanted it. Because we wanted to see 2 megahertz of display bandwidth, not 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz. So it, with uh, the Elonix E4000 chip kind of in uh, some kind of unknown state, we're not sure where this will go. This picture is our breadboard. Now that is all going to fit down onto a little dongle eventually. And if you believe that, I got some land that I want to sell you. Swamp land in Arizona. It will. Because these are basically development boards that we are taking one chip off of here and one chip off of here. These are like A to D boards, and we're using one of the parts. But it's a quick way to get your, your system up and running. And we're estimating a cost of about $200. I don't know where that's going to go. That's kind of on hold for right now. But I wanted to show you guys that because I thought you might be interested. Yes? Oh, OK, no. I'd like to talk to you afterwards. 820T? OK. R820T. OK, thanks. OK, that's all I have. The information, uh, we have a Yahoo group. If you can bear to, to sign up for a Yahoo group, um, that's where the preliminary information will be available of where you'll be able to get one and what the final pricing will be and all that. The B micro and the B radio, are the B micro is available now from Arrow Electronics. The B radio is planned by Arrow to be bundled with the B micro and, and 
keep an eye out for this because what they're planning to do is at all the aero offices, and there's hundreds of them worldwide, they're going to set up a seminar series uh, for SDR. And the idea is you pay $100 and you get a half day seminar and lunch and they give you a free B micro and B radio board. And then they lead you through all the steps necessary to see what's involved in making a radio. And it's a standalone radio, so this is not going to be a GNU radio tutorial, but it's going to be an, more of an FPGA tutorial. And because we wrote all the FPGA code to do this, and we just really commented it and made it modular, so it should be relatively easy to understand. So if you're interested in maybe stepping to the side of GNU radio and understanding more of what happens inside your FPGAs, like on your USRP, this would be a great class to take. It's cheap. Uh, it's, it, it'll be relatively simple and it'll really get your feet wet fast on FPGAs as they apply to radios. So, thank you. The, okay, uh, the question is where, where are the uh, seminars going to be held. No, we're, we're writing the material for the seminars, but they're going to be given by the local Aero FAEs all over the country. So there'll be one here. I know, I know the guy in Chicago, and I know you'll have a seminar there. They'll be, and they'll be worldwide, so you'll be able to hopefully find one near you. Um, good question. Um, I guess the, the short answer is that we're not going to do any more. The, oh, sorry. The question was, uh, we, he sees receivers. Are we planning any transmitter boards? And yeah, the short answer is yes. The long answer is I'm not sure when that will be. And I don't think that we're going to continue on any more B micro boards. The next board is going to have an internal FPGA. It will be a little bit bigger. And at that point, then we can put a transmitter on it. The, the problem, one of the problems we're having is the FPGA is too small. I mean, it's, it's just like the old days of computers, right? You run out of memory, you run out of disk. Maybe not so much anymore, but uh, the FPGA is too small, so we want to fix that. And I think also the B micro is kind of a little limiting because it, it's not going to be av available forever. So we want to, you know, build something that's more long, has a longer life, and maybe uh, bigger FPGA is going to be more useful. All right. Thanks. Thank you.